Answers Live, where you'll get honest answers to your Bible questions. Let's face it, it's not always easy to understand everything you read in the Bible. With 66 books and more than 700,000 words, the Bible can generate a lot of questions. If you'd like answers to your Bible questions, you've come to the right place. Now, here's your host, Pastor Doug Batchelor, President and Speaker of Amazing Facts. Hello, listening friends. Would you like to hear an amazing fact? Back in 1988, a man in Edmore, Michigan, was looking to buy a farm. While touring the property with the seller, he asked about a large, oddly shaped rock that was propping open a back door. The old farmer said it was a meteorite that he saw fall from the sky one night in the 1930s. In fact, when he pulled it from the ground the next morning, he said it was still warm. The old farmer sold the farm complete with the meteorite doorstop. The new owner lived on the farm for a few years, and when he moved, he took the mystery rock with him, where he continued to use it to prop open a different door for another 30 years. Once or twice, he allowed his kids to take the heavy rock to school for show and tell. Recently, the owner, who asked to remain anonymous, became curious and brought the rock to the Central Michigan University Geology Department. That's when Professor Mona Serbescu agreed to test the rock. I could tell right away that this was something very special, Sebescu said. After testing, she determined it was indeed a meteorite made of 88% iron and 12% nickel. This isn't just any space rock, though. Weighing 22 pounds, it is the sixth largest recorded meteorite ever found in Michigan. And according to CMU, it's potentially worth $100,000. Imagine using a precious $100,000 rock to prop open a door for 80 years. Do you know the Bible talks about another very valuable stone that was overlooked by an entire nation? Stay with us, friends. We're going to learn more on this edition of Bible Answers Live. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, honest answers to your Bible questions. Our phone lines are now open. If you have a Bible-related question, call us at 1-800-GOD-SAYS. That's 1-800-463-7297. Now, let's join our host, Pastor Doug Batchelor, and our co-host, Pastor Jean Ross. Welcome, listening friends, to Bible Answers Live. And if we've got some new listeners out there, this program is, just as the title implies, a live call-in Bible answer program. If you have any Bible questions, it's a free phone call. You can call it in right now. Lines are open. 800 800- Four six three seven two nine seven. That's eight hundred. God says. I'll give it to you one more time. Call in with your questions. Eight hundred four six three seven two nine seven. And as mentioned earlier, my name is Doug Batchelor. And my name is Jean Ross. Good evening, listening friends, and also those who are joining us on Facebook tonight. We're glad you're part of our Bible study right here on this international Bible study together mm-hmm. with Bible Answers Live. Well, before we get to the program, Pastor Doug, let's start with prayer. Dear Father in Heaven, once again, thank you for the opportunity to just spend some time in your Word, studying the Scriptures together. We want to ask your blessing upon this program. Be with those who are listening and guide Mm -hmm. us as we search the Scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Doug, you opened the program by talking about, well, a rock that uh, was worth or is worth somewhere around $100,000 propping open a door. And I wonder how many times the people tripped over that rock. Maybe they had financial need and they didn't realize that right there at their doorstep was, well, the solution to their financial problems. (laughs) That's right. $100,000 just, you know, sitting there. I heard another story about one of the biggest gold nuggets found in North America, a boy fishing. He's playing hooky one morning. He's supposed to be at church. Named Conrad Reed, and they used it to prop open a door because it it wasn't gold. It was kind of black. Someone later realized it was a gold nugget. Hmm. And it makes me think, that story and the other makes me think about a passage in the Bible that appears about 10 times, talks about a stumbling stone that was overlooked. And it's based on a story in Jewish history when they were building the Temple of Solomon. They carved the precious stones ahead of time at the quarry, very precisely carved. And the cornerstone that was going to set the course for the whole building, they put it on the building site first thing. Well, when the con- contractors or the, con- the uh, carpenters and the builders 
started looking around for the cornerstone. They kept bumping into this rock right in the middle. It was an odd shape because it sat partly on stone and partly on the hillside, and it was square at other parts. And they got so tired of bumping into it, they said, get that thing out of here. We keep tripping over it and running into it. And they pushed it off into the Kidron Valley. Later, they said, where's that cornerstone that we asked for? You should have had it here a long time ago. And they said, we did send it. And lo and behold, it, it was the stone that they had dumped off into the valley was the cornerstone for the whole temple. Well, that became a legend. It became a, um, a real point of history in, in uh, Hebrew scriptures. It's mentioned in Psalms, mentioned about nine times in the New Testament. Hebrews, Jesus mentions it, Peter mentions it. The stone of stumbling. Let me read that to you, friends. It's 1 Peter 2, and I'll read verse 4 through 8. Coming to him, that's Jesus, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Therefore it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. He who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word which they were also appointed. Here it's talking about when Jesus came, they didn't like his word because it went against some of their traditions. And, you know, they're still, these were the professed people of God. And, you know, the early church, of course, all the apostles were Jewish, but many of the Jewish nation rejected Jesus. And he was that rock of stumbling. Christ said, he that hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man building his house on the rock. And Jesus is that rock of ages. And there's a reason the Ten Commandments were written on a stone. It represents its eternal nature. Now, some out there may be still wondering, how is a Christian supposed to relate to the law of God so that we don't stumble in disobedience? We have a free lesson. You really need to read this, friends, so that uh, you can be building on the rock for the last days and the storm that's coming. Pastor Ross? We have a study guide called Written in Stone. It's all about the Ten Commandments, God's law, the foundation for a happy life, and we'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. The number to call is 800-835-6747. That is the resource phone line, and you can just ask for the study guide called Written in Stone. We'll be happy to send it to anyone who calls and asks. Again, mm -hmm. that number is 800-835-6747. And if you have a Bible question, the phone line here to the studio is 800-463-7297. Again, one more time, 800-463-7297. Pastor Doug, our first caller this evening, we have uh, Bill, who is listening in Illinois. Bill, welcome to the program. Hi, Pastor Doug, Pastor John. How are you this evening? Great. Thanks for calling. And your question? Um, actually, I'm calling for some advice. Um, I don't even know where to begin, but um, about... 20 years ago, my mother asked me if I ever thought about going to church and being prayed over and anointed. So I asked her why, and she said, because I was, she took me as a baby. She said I was really sick, and she said I screamed all the time. I wouldn't sleep. She said I threw up anything I ate, and she said I'd break out in, in horrible rashes, I turned blue, and the doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. So she decided to listen to my grandmother and basically took me to a witch for healing. Are you wondering if that's having said, an impact on your life now? And she said that I was healed, I was never sick again. And, she's, and what I'm wondering is, does God hold me accountable for that? Well, no, because, because first I, of all, you're a baby. A, it's no decision of yours, right? No. Yeah, so had, when you come, to, you're a Christian, right? Yes. And all you need to do, the Bible tells us that if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin. And part of what happens when you come to Jesus he not only saves you from bad decisions you have made, but he can save you from inherited problems. And so uh, you come to the Lord, and the power of Christ is greater than the power of the devil. The Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
So, you know, some people wonder if p having parents that dabbled in, you know, Ouija boards and the dark arts, my mom used to do that. And she fooled with witches and astrology and all that stuff. And But once I came to Jesus, I just felt the spirit come into my life. And it, none of that stuff has to stick to you. You just ask and the I Lord to do laugh. Life. Yeah. Because I was like, she was <laughs> basically saying I should go be, have an exorcism done. And I just, I kind of laughed at it. I thought it was funny, but she says she, she said she even went as far to tell me as the witch, this, this woman made her leave the house because she said it was my mother that was blocking her powers from working. Well, you know what? And she said, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And then she said it, she left and she said about 15 minutes later, she said, I was supposedly healed and was never sick again. Well, you and know, so she thought that. Yeah, I was going to say that d there are cases, many cases where there are faith healers that may be working for the enemy that have some power, it, it seems like, to heal. And don't forget, many times when Jesus healed a person, matter of fact, most of the time, he never said, my faith has made you whole. He said, um, your faith has made you whole. So sometimes people come with faith to a faith healer, and it could be a witch, it could be a, a, a fraud, and based on their faith, they're healed. Uh, so the devil can manipulate people. That's why, you know, we've got a lesson that talks about how do you know about true prophet, false prophet, sorcerers, witches, and I think Bill would really appreciate that. We'll be happy to send that to you for free, Bill. All you'll need to do is just call and ask. The study guide is called Does God Inspire Psychics? And we'll be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks, and it deals with the subject of how do we gain victory over the powers of darkness? And uh, The number to call is 800-463. Uh, actually, that is the phone line here to the studio. The number to call for the free offer is 800-835-6747. That number again is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the study guide, Does God Inspire Psychics and Astrologers? Next caller that we have is Justin listening in California. Justin, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, your question tonight. Yes, uh, my question is pretty simple. Um, when Moses had the two, the first two original uh, tablets of stone, and he threw them down and they broke, mm -hmm. now was that a sign that um, the nation of Israel would kind of break, I guess, break the first covenant? Well, they, they had broken the covenant when, of course, they made the golden calf. A covenant is an agreement. And God gives them the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. The written copy is in Exodus 20. The spoken version is Exodus 20. The people hear God say, this is my covenant. They declare all the Lord has said we will do. In other words, they said, look, we agree to the terms of the covenant. So Moses goes up the mountain to get the first written copy. They make a golden calf during that 40-day interval. They become, they lose faith, they get distracted, and then they have a wild party and probably break several other commandments. And so Moses casting the stones out of his hands was basically, you know, in his fury, he was saying, you, you've broken the covenant. I just went up the mountain. I haven't even, the ink isn't even dry, metaphorically, and uh, you've broken it. And so the stones breaking was a sign of their breaking the covenant. When they humbled themselves and repented, God said to Moses, come back up the mountain, except this time you cut the stones and I will write on them again, the writing on the first set of stones. And um, so, yeah, it was sort of a symbol that they had violated the covenant. You know, we do have a, f a free oh. book that deals with this called Why the Old Covenant Failed and actually deals mm -hmm. with this very subject. And we'll be happy to send that to you, Justin. All you'll need to do is just call us. The number to call is 800-835-6747. And you can ask for the book called Why the Old Covenant Failed. Yeah, and I think you'll awesome. be blessed by thank that. You. Does that help? Yes, it helps a lot. Very I'll good. call for the book. All right, thank you. Next caller that we have is listening from Florida. We have James on the line. James, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you for having me, Pastor Doug, Pastor John. Yeah. And your question. Yeah, uh, my, my, yes, uh, my question pertains to um, being a Seventh-day Adventist and going to church, obviously, on the Sabbath. And having the occasional opportunity of ever visiting a different church that happens to um, hold services on Sunday, um, I ask because 
every now and then I'll bump into some very nice, friendly Christians. They invite me to attend a service at their church, which happens to be on a Sunday. I find myself hesitant to doing so, mainly because I've heard before from other Adventists that going to church on Sundays are considered did we lose him? You still hear me? Still hear me? Yeah, we're there. You're back. There we go. So your question, James, is: okay. Sorry about that. Is it is it wrong to yes. sometimes go to church on Sunday if you believe Saturday is the Sabbath? Right. Exactly. My main point is that ideally, I would love for these people to occasionally visit my church on the Sabbath and see what it's all about. But I kind of seem like a hypocrite that I'm not even willing to attend their church to begin with. So it kind of seems like it's hard to convince them to do so if I'm not willing to, to do it either. All right. Well, you know, the, the commandment, of course, says, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. And uh, But it doesn't say a person can't go to church any other day. And so I've gone to visit people. Um, I remember once I was doing some evangelistic meetings and I invited people. They said, well, you come visit our church. We'll come visit yours. I said, you got a deal. <laughs> And uh, we kept our bargain. They kept their bargain. So, um, yeah, you know, you can go to church on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And, you know, we have prayer meeting in our church on Tuesday nights. Mm -hmm. So, you know, visiting people, now if you, it's different, uh, you know, visiting and worshiping. You can worship seven days a week. We should. It's different than keeping a day as the holy day or Sabbath and a day of rest. And so hopefully that helps answer your question. You know, we do have a book called Why God Said Remember, and it deals with the subject of the Sabbath, and we'd be happy to send it to anyone who calls and asks. The number is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the book called Why God Said Remember. Our next caller is, let's see, I think we have caller listening from Texas. We have Zachary. Zachary, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? All doing this evening. Good. Appreciate your call. Yeah, appreciate your call. Well, I think you got a radio on me. in the I background. You might want to turn it down. Do I? Yeah. I, I don't. Do I? All oh, right. We can hear you now. That's good. Is there, is there a lot of feedback? We can hear you. Your question. Okay. Um, I'd like to make this as as quick as I can for y'all, but I am a sixth generation Adventist, and I'm I'm gonna need a pretty deep answer on this one. Um, I am currently uh, a rebaptized Christian. I was gone for about two years. Um, I went to academy and all that. Um, anyways, my my question is, is: Is heaven really something that I desire? Because I seem to be so infected with the desires for the things of this world and I actually I find temporary satisfaction in them on what seems to be a more and more regular basis um, I understand what Paul said about I do the things that I, I don't want to do the thing is I still want to do them and I'm, I'm wondering you know it, I am so grateful for what Jesus did but I don't know if I want to spend an eternity being grateful for that. You know, I probably sound really terrible saying that. No, I I think I know where you're coming from. Well, sometimes you, like, question you, your... You know, heaven really is... is are you wishing that you more loved... More like slavery the longer I... Are you I wishing that you it. had more hunger and thirst for righteousness? I... I... I yes. yes. All right. Well, then that's, a, that's the answer right there, is that... Um, you need to pray and say, Lord, you know, he says there's a blessing on those who are, of course, poor in spirit, meek, peacemakers, and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sounds like that the world and sin is making you lose your interest and your passion. When you have the new birth, uh, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. So as you continue to look at his love for you, Zachary, and you think about how much um, he's done for you, that will inspire you to love him back. Uh, you need to experience genuine repentance. That's a sorrow for sin and a willingness to turn away from it. That comes from the goodness of God leads us to repentance. As you behold the love of God and the goodness of God, it leads you to repentance. And you're going to start loving the things you maybe once hated and hated the things you once loved. But 
Yeah, if you're thinking, boy, I'd be bored being in heaven, you need to get to know the Lord more. It's like saying, I don't want to be with this uh, woman that I've married. Well, you should love that person. <laughs> so um, if you're going to love the Lord, um, you need to spend time with him communicating. You know, we have a book that kind of deals with this important subject, and it's called The Surrender of Self. In order for us to have true freedom in Christ, there is a bit of a battle where we need to surrender ourselves, our will, to the will of God. It's not an occasional thing that we do, but the Apostle Paul says, I die daily. So it's a daily surrender. We'll be happy to send you the book. It's free. Well, it's called The Surrender of Self. And I think you'd find that helpful, Zachary, and anyone dealing with this very important subject. How can we learn to love God more? The number to call is 800-835-6747. And you can ask for the book called The Surrender of Self. And we'll be happy to send it to anyone who calls and asks. Our next caller that we have is uh, Eric listening from Massachusetts. Uh, no, wait a minute, from Tennessee. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the program. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. And your question tonight? Uh, my question is, why do we pray in Jesus' name? Well, that's good. Good question. Um, and especially because the Bible says Jesus knows what things you need even before you ask. So when you pray in Jesus' name, it's basically like saying, Lord, uh, I want you to hear my prayer, not because I deserve it, but for the name, for the sake of your son. It's like um, uh, you've got a good friend and you ask the parent if you could help in the name of their child who is your friend. Well, the, you know, Jesus paid for your sin and his life is uh, a substitute for our lives. And so we're, when we're praying, we're asking the Father to give us credit for his goodness so it's in his name. It's kind of like if you go to the bank and say, could you cash my check? And they look and your account is empty. But then you say, no, this check is not a check in my account. It's a check in God's account and he's got a billion dollars. Having God's name on the account means that the check is good. So we pray in Jesus' name because he's got enough money in the bank. That's a rough example. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Hey, thank you very much. Now, I've got, a, I've got a, a free book. I'll be happy to send you, Eric. And it's called uh, The Name of God. And it has an interesting story in there about the Civil War and praying in Jesus' name you'll like. It's called The Name of God. You're the welcome. number to call for that is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the book called The Name of God, and we'll be happy to send it to you, Eric, or anyone who calls and asks. The next caller that we have is Robert, and he's listening in, uh, where is that, Pastor Doug? Is that in? Indiana? Yeah. All right, Robert in Indiana, welcome to the program. Uh, hello. Nice to meet you guys. Thanks for calling. And your question? My question is, in the Bible, um, concerning like the rapture and first resurrection, it says first the dead will be caught up, and then we will be caught up and we'll meet in the air. Um, a lot of people, you know, uh, will say that no one that that's when people will first get to heaven. Now I had a near death experience, and I know I experienced heaven. So is the being caught up is that only when we receive our spiritual bodies? And why was my spirit able to experience that and go there? for a brief amount of time. Well, you know, I can't give you an answer on what your personal experience is. When we decide what is true, we don't ask everybody in an interview what experience of his have you had. Truth is, of course, and I'm sure you agree, determined by what does the Bible say. Um, because you talk to people around the world from many religions, they'll say, well, I had this experience. The Lord could give you a dream and experience to speak to you personally. Um, a person may have, I've had dreams before where I know the Lord was talking to me, but, you know, I don't want other people basing their theology on my dream. But so, this was a near-death experience. It wasn't a dream. Well, it, uh, yeah, even I mean, that. It could have been both. Okay, well, even if you have a near-death experience, uh, the Lord might impress you with an experience, but that's between you and the Lord. That's, it's, in other words, we don't base our theology on that. So... Um, the Bible is pretty clear that when a person dies, they're unconscious mm -hmm. until the resurrection. The Bible says the living know they'll die, and this is Ecclesiastes 9, but the dead don't know anything. And But when you die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When you die, your next conscious thought is the resurrection. 
So for you, there seems like no time has gone by. See what I'm saying? So and, is it possible maybe since I had died, my next conscious thought was there, but he told me maybe it wasn't my time, so he sent me back? Oh, the Lord may have given you this experience to try to help you have a revival of some sort. I, you know, I'm not sure that would be between you and the Lord. I just know that people don't go to heaven or hell before the judgment, and the judgment day is in the future. God doesn't pull people out of hell and then judge them, and he doesn't pull people out of heaven and judge them. And Jesus said, Behold, he comes, and he'll reward every man according to his works. And that's Revelation chapter 1, is that verse 7. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we have a study guide I think you'll really enjoy. It's on the subject of death. And we'd like to send you a free copy of that, Robert, if it's okay, Pastor Ross. And you can read it online, too. Yes, the, uh, the one dealing with the subject of death and the resurrection is called Are the Dead Really Dead? And uh, I'm going to give you another resource, too, talking about the second coming. It's called Anything But Secret. So two free offers relating to the subject. The one is a study guide called Are the Dead Really Dead? And the other is a book called Anything But Secret. And we'll be happy to send this to you, Robert, or anyone who calls and asks. Just a phone call away. The number is 800-835-6747. Ask for those resources, and we'll be happy to send it out to you. You can also read this for free online at the Amazing Facts website, just amazingfacts.org. There is a link that you can click on, and that'll take you to our media library. And all of the resources that we are talking about are also available for you right there on the website. I well, Pastor Doug, I'm looking at the clock. Do we have time for another call? What if we start a question? If we don't finish it, we'll bring them back after the break. All right. We've got, let's see, we go to Maria in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Maria, welcome to the program. Maria, she may have her mute on. Are you there, Maria? All, All right. right. We'll try again. Let's see. Maria, are you there? Maria, New York. Yes. Okay. Yes. Why don't you state your question, and then we may need to answer it after the break. Okay. Um, my question is, um, in the Bible, the story about Moses, it says that God hardened the Pharaoh's heart. How do I know if that's happened to me? Because I struggle when I read the Bible. I don't understand, and I know I've read somewhere where it says um, they won't be able to understand. They'll see, and they'll not be able to see or hear and not understand something right like that yeah effect. seeing they so see but do don't I understand know, right right so how do i know if that's what's happened to me how do i know that that's the reason i can't understand what i read great question you're going to be first in line maria when we get back we'll be answering that very important question about making sure our hearts aren't hardened be right back stay tuned bible answers live will return in a moment Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts Media Library at AFTV.org. At AFTV.org, you can enjoy video and audio presentations as well as printed material all free of charge, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.org. Would you like to know God's plan for our broken world as revealed in Bible prophecy? Want practical, trusted solutions for your biggest challenges? Freshly updated and redesigned, Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides provide 27 Bible-based topical lessons with beautiful graphics and straightforward answers that are enlightening, encouraging, and easy to understand. Each study guide leads you toward real, relevant Bible answers for the most important questions in your life. How can I have healthier relationships? When and how will Jesus come again? And so much more. Don't leave your future to chance. Transform your life with truths from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides. Prefer to watch while you read? Our brand new Prophecy Encounters DVD series makes the perfect companion set. Don't wait. Order your study guides and DVD set today by visiting afbookstore.com or by calling 800-538-7275. Did you know that Noah was present at the birth of Abraham? Okay, maybe he wasn't in the room, but he was alive and probably telling stories about his floating zoo. 
From the creation of the world to the last day events of Revelation, BibleHistory.com is a free resource where you can explore major Bible events and characters. Enhance your knowledge of the Bible and draw closer to God's Word. Go deeper. Visit the amazing Bible timeline at BibleHistory.com. Every Bible question you have answered moves you one step closer to the fullness of God's will for your life. So what are you waiting for? Get the answers you need for a fuller, richer, more confident life. You're listening to Bible Answers Live. We still have a few phone lines open. If you have a Bible-related question, call us at 1-800-GOD-SAYS. That's 1-800-463-7297. Now, let's join pastors Doug Batchelor and Jean Ross for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome back, listening friends. For those that have tuned in somewhere along the way, this is Bible Answers Live, and we are taking live Bible questions, doing our best with the Bible resources at our fingertips here to give answers. We search the Word together. Uh, before the break, we started with a question from Maria. Maria, are you still there with us? Yes, yes. Now, you are asking a question about, you talked about uh, God hardening Pharaoh's heart. You wonder sometimes if right. your heart is hard and you don't want it mm -hmm. to be, and uh, how right. can you prevent that from happening? Right. You have the freedom. Now, if you read in Hebrews chapter 3, it says, Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. The children of Israel hardened their hearts. Now, God would never ask us not to do something if we had no power to make a decision. So when God appeals to us, please do not harden your heart, you can choose to soften your heart. Now, the, what that's talking about we Pharaoh hardened his heart in pride. We open our hearts with humility. We ask the Lord to forgive our sins, to forgive our pride. We humble ourselves before the Lord. And he begins to hear your prayers and answer your prayers. So, um, no, you don't have to be hard-hearted. And, you know, I've, we've all felt hard-hearted. Sometimes I, I just wish I loved Jesus more. I'll read the story of the cross, and I'll think about how moving it is, and I'll say, Lord, that ought to move me more. I wish I loved you better. And, you know, I realize it's the, just the hardness of my heart and my pride. I then humble myself, and I find the Holy Spirit does soften your heart. You know, we do have a book called, and I think you'd find this very helpful, Maria. It's called 12 Steps to Revival. It actually gives you some okay. practical steps that you can take to have a closer connection, that experience of revival. And uh, we'll send it to you for free. All you'll have to do is give us a call. Okay. And again, ask for the book called 12 Steps to Revival. The number to call is 800-835-6747 and ask for the book 12 Steps to Revival. I got one more verse for you, Maria, before you go, because I know there's other people out there that probably feel the same mm -hmm. way. This is Ezekiel 1119. If you remember Ezekiel 1119, I write it down. Listen to this promise. Then I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within them. I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. God promises with okay. a new birth that he will take away our hard hearts and give us a loving, soft heart. And so you need to pray for that, that gift of the Holy Spirit, and he does that. Okay. That's a promise from God. He keeps his promises. Right, right. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, now, if I, w if I wrote two amazing facts and I directed questions would you be able to answer them? We do. We have a Bible correspondence okay. department, and we do our best to answer every question people send in. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you so much, and you have a good night. You too. Thank you, Maria. Next one uh, that we have is uh, Cordero listening in Texas. Cordero, welcome to the program. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you for calling. And your question? Sure. Um my question is, since there seems to be a, a lot of controversy and a lot of opinions on this, what what does the Bible specifically say about a post, um, pre, or mid-tribulation rapture? All right, let me explain that for our listeners. I know what you mean, but some listening may not. Um, virtually all Christians agree there's going to be a tribulation before the end. 
Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24, Mark 13. You read about it in Daniel chapter 12, a great time of trouble before the second coming. Some have wondered, will the Lord come and save the church out of the world before that tribulation? That's a pre-tribulation rapture. Some have wondered maybe three and a half years into seven years of tribulation that in the middle of it he'll take people out. And some have believed that the Lord comes at the end of that tribulation and the destruction of the wicked and salvation of the righteous happens at the same time. That's called post-trib. So, um, so when does the Lord come? Do we have to be here on earth during the tribulation? Uh, probably Pastor Ross and I stand with what you would call the old Protestant reformers that believed that the church is going to be in the world and that God saves them not from the tribulation, but through the tribulation. The reasons being, the seven last plagues in Revelation are called the Great Tribulation. You read about them, what is it, chapter 15, 16, Pastor Ross? Mm -hmm. And uh, in that Great Tribulation, you've got just all this devastation and desolation that happens. God preserves his people during that time. It's like the ten plagues that fell on the Israelites. God did not save the children of Israel from the ten plagues. They were in Egypt when the plagues fell. He saved them through the plagues. He protected them. It's like God saved Noah through the storm. He saved Job through his trials. He saved Joseph through his trials. The Bible says it is through tribulation we enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said, he that endures to the end, the same will be saved. So there's just so many scriptures that talk about God's people preserving, or per persevering, I should say. So we're of the opinion that, yes, there is a tribulation. We believe that the church is in the world, and we are being faithful through that final trial, and that the, uh, the second coming of the rapture takes place at the end of that. So we have a lesson. I don't know if you're still on. Uh, if you can hear this, but we have a free study guide we'll offer you. It's a book that I can give you called um, Anything But Secret. It talks about the tribulation in that order. Are you still there, uh, Cordero? Let's try one more time. Cordero, can you hear us? I'm here. Oh. I'm here. Hello. Yes, you see. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Pastor Doug mentioned that book. We want to make sure you're able to get that. It's called Anything But Secret. And to get that, give us a call. The number is 800-835-6747. And you can ask for the book called Anything But Secret. Uh, yeah. Thank you guys for uh, giving us a, a lot of knowledge on that. and it's, it's truly been a privilege. Well, thank you. Appreciate your call. Next caller that we have is Zach listening from St. Joseph, Missouri. I know where that is. Hi, Zach. Welcome to the program. Hi. How are you? Good. And your question? Yeah, my question is, um, why is it that people believe that Jesus is begotten and that he's not a part of the Trinity? A lot of people don't believe that that, that Jesus is God. So why well, I don't mean? know why they believe. Well, I shouldn't say I don't know why, but it confuses people sometimes. The incarnation is a mystery, that Jesus laid aside his divinity. And I believe you see that in Colossians where it talks about he made himself of no reputation. Uh, he laid aside his divinity. He gave us an example to walk even as he walked. He lived as a man. It's hard for us to comprehend someone being 100% divine, 100% man. We can't comprehend that. But there's no question. He says, before Abraham was, I am. He talks in John 17 about the glory he had with the Father before the world was. So Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. He's called the Alpha and the Omega. Omega. He's the eternal one. So you look at the definitions of Jesus. All things that were made were made by him, right? John 1. Well, yeah. the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So who is the God that created? And Jesus is a creator. He's called the everlasting father, too. So um, I, I think that Christ is eternal. I feel sorry for people that don't understand the deity of Christ because you've either got the creator dying for the creation or you've got a creature who has been created dying for the creation another creature could not pay for the sins of the entire world he's just made by the lord but because he's the creator 
he died for the creatures. That's different. Right. And, and a lot of people use Deuteronomy 6, 4 to kind of kind of refute that whole idea. And, and I know that that word there, uh, the Lord our God is one, is the word akkad. Isn't there another Hebrew word that kind of shows a difference between, you know, unity and, and such? Like yeah, that? yeah, there are a couple of words that are used. But uh, when the Bible says a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the, Jesus prays in John 17 that the disciples would be one. Well, there were 12 of them. And he says, Father, m you know, um, I pray the disciples be one even as you and I are one. So Jesus explains what it means when Moses says that there's one God. You also got to keep in mind Moses is talking to a nation that just came out of Egypt where they had one God for the river, another one for the sun, another one for the animals. They had all these different gods. And the gods often were at war with each other, like the Greek gods didn't get along. And Moses said, no, our God is a united God. He is one, perfect in unity. So right. that's a concept people need to keep in mind. You know, we do have a book well, dealing hey. with the subject of the Trinity, Zach, that I think you'd find interesting, or anyone listening, to get it, just give us a call. The book's called The Trinity. Is it biblical? The number to call is 800-835-6747. And you can ask for the book, Talking About the Trinity. Our next caller is Frank. Frank, welcome to the program. Hi. Uh, my question is, if we make a promise and then later realize that we have promised to do something sinful, are we morally obligated to keep that promise? That's a great question. Um, you know, the Bible says, I think it's Psalm 15, Pastor Ross, where he says, a believer who swears to his own hurt and changes not. If you make a promise, and suppose you promise to pay somebody for something, and you, you end up losing money in the deal, a Christian, you should still pay it. But what if you're a Christian, before you're a Christian, you make a promise to serve the devil? You're, you're depressed, and you're a, you're a misguided teenager, and you say, I'm going to just serve the devil. I'm vowing now. I'm promising devil. I'm going to serve you. Well, later you find out about Jesus. Are you obligated to keep your promise to the devil? I would say I would, no. Uh, well, that's my question. Yeah, <laughs> I'd uh, say well, no. Yeah, definitely, I would say no. I, I would say that you were encouraged to make that promise uh, under a bad influence and um, of the devil. Of course, you should never vow foolishly, but, um, you know, people have made... Oh, uh, let me give you an example, and I, I hope I'm not going to lose people's respect, but... I used to hitchhike, and sometimes I got desperate. When I was a teenager, I used to hitchhike around the country. And sometimes I'd wait for hours for a road for a car to come and pick me up. And I prayed, and I'd say things kind of desperate. I'd say, Lord, if you would just give me a ride, I promise if I ever get a car, I will pick up every hitchhiker that I see. You know, and when I did get a car, I tried to do that for a while. But I realized over time it was not a very practical thing. I couldn't always do it. Sometimes there were five people and a dog that were on the road, and I just didn't have room for them. So right away I broke my promise. And so I, I think the Lord smiles, and I apologize. I, I said, Lord, forgive me. That was a, a foolish vow. Now, the Bible says you got to be careful. It, not, you're better not to vow than to vow and not to pay. But, you know, I think we all do rash things sometimes. And... Um, there was an interesting law they had that if a wife made a rash vow, the husband could forgive her, overrule it. And I think sometimes our Father in Heaven, He smiles and overrules rash promises that we make to the devil. Um, but we should always keep our word as Christians. You see what I'm saying? Well, the verse you're referring to there, oh, Pastor yeah. Doug, is Psalms 15, verse 4, where it says, But he who honors those who fear the Lord, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Like Jeff, the promise that whatever came through the gates of his house, he would consecrate to the Lord if God gave him victory over the, I think it was the Moabites. And God gave him victory. Well, the first thing that came through his gates was his daughter. He thought it was going to be a goat or sheep or cow. And so he consecrated his daughter to the temple for the rest of her life. She never married. Kept his word. Hey, thank you, Frank. I hope that helps a little bit. And, um, Appreciate your question. Our next caller is uh, Rodney, listening in Illinois. Rodney, welcome to the program. Hey guys, nice to talk to you, Pastor Doug. You're doing, thank you, thank you so much for all the what you're doing. 
Well, thank you. And your question? Yes. Uh, my question is, um, I'm, I'm, uh, everybody notice that the world right now is polarizing between liberalism and conservatism. So, uh, as a as a Christian, what is what should be your stand towards this uh, main for political or social uh, polarization? Well, if you're if you're living in a country, let's use the United States for example, because most of our listeners are in the U.S., where you have a representative form of government, that means that as a believer, you obey the laws of the land. Every believer has one vote, and you want <coughs> your you want your vote to be making a difference for policies and positions that would protect religious freedom, and that would support biblical principles. So there may be some difference of Christians out there of what, you know, what candidates will best do that. And it varies from state to state in local elections, city elections, national elections. But there's nothing wrong with a Christian having a political view. We've got to be careful that we don't become so preoccupied with. I know there's a lot of emotion in the last week. A matter of fact, Karen and I, a week ago, were in Washington, D.C., in the Capitol uh, and in the White House. I, I know people are going to wonder about that. But anyway, we were there speaking to different leaders about religious liberty issues. And the the emotions were extremely high last week on both sides of the aisle, as they say, over this uh, justice confirmation process. A and Christians have to be careful. We don't get so caught up in earthly governments. We forget that we are first and foremost citizens of another kingdom. A Christian does have dual citizenship, though you do have to live in the world and you want to... Uh, be a good citizen. So, d am I uh, am I helping uh, answer your question? Uh, yes, that's 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 exactly what I think. Can I can I add a, a something else for you? Can uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sure let me say one thought. more thing, and then I'll let you add. Uh, I okay. do have a sermon online because I get this question before elections, and I did a sermon a few years yes. ago called "Should a Christian Vote." And you can find that just YouTube Doug Bachelor vote, and you'll probably find it. But go ahead. You okay. had another comment. No, uh, I, I, because lately I can't identify myself. I used to identify myself as conservative, uh, but because most liberals sometimes try to uh, uh, pass legislation against moral values of Christians, mm -hmm. but conservatives try to pass uh, legislation forcing people to for to to those probably moral values I want. And I think Christianity is not about forcing people with legislation, but uh, bringing Jesus, right? So technically, it's a difficult situation right now for me to uh, uh, side with conservatives because I don't. I really want to bring Jesus to them, not uh, not a political or or uh, ideology. Yeah. Uh, so I I really uh, I'm in between in between that situation with what happened lately about the supreme court judge and everything you know yeah well let's, let's think, keep it to uh, a bible question though <laughs> okay yeah okay that's fine, that's is, fine. Is, all yeah. right so yeah the main thing is that use biblical principles to guide you it sounds like you're doing that and um uh, you know you want to uh, keep in mind don't put your faith in any political party because herod and Pilate finally made friends when it came time to crucify jesus and the Sadducees and the Pharisees were opposite. The Sadducees were liberals. The Pharisees were conservatives. But they got together to crucify Jesus. So if you're putting all your faith in one party or the other, you might be surprised. Our next caller hey, that thanks. we have is Jordan listening from Huntington. Jordan, welcome to the program. Huntington, Hi West there. Virginia. Yeah. How are you? Good. Thank you for calling. And your question, Jordan. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, in John 10.34... Jesus clearly says that, uh, well, he says, you are God. And that is a very bold word coming from God himself. Yeah, and you're wondering, now you notice in uh, your Bible, I'm pretty sure you notice it's got a small g in front of it. Uh, yes, it does, but God can only mean one thing. Well, in that verse, of course, uh, do you believe that you are a God like God? 
Well, no, I most certainly can't create the universe. I don't know where to begin. Yeah, all right. What the Lord is saying, Jesus is quoting, and Pastor Ross might have to look that up. Jesus is quoting one of the Psalms where I think David says, you know, uh, have I not said ye are gods? And what he means by that is that um, man is so far superior to the animals because we are made in the image of God. The Bible says of Adam, you are the son of God. Uh, man was given dominion over the planet before he lost it to the devil. So it's, it's referring to, for the world, man was basically the God of this world. We were given dominion of the world. We were created to be eternal creatures. No, we don't have the ability to create like God, but we do have the ability through love and marriage to procreate in our own image. So Jesus is just using an allegory there. He's not saying we're anything like the eternal self-existent God. So he's saying that we are gods of the earth. Yeah, Adam was made basically the, the Lord of the world. And he was made in the image sure. of God. Man is so made a little lower God, than the angels. We are not gods. So being gods of the earth, then is we are to be stewards of God's creation and take care of the animals yeah. and the, the, the plants and the earth. I see. So, so it would be best if we didn't eat the animals then. Is that correct? Well, I don't. I'm a vegetarian. I, I think in heaven we're going to be... Uh, in heaven, I think everybody's going to be a vegetarian. <laughs> I can't see anybody chasing down a chicken in heaven to decapitate it and eat it. So uh, I'm just getting ready early. But, uh, yep, that's right. Man was made to keep the garden, to dress and to keep it. And God gave them every beautiful tree with all kinds of fruit. None of the fruit was called Big Mac or Whopper. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for your call, Jordan. Our next call is Becky listening from Michigan. Becky, welcome to the program. Hello, how are you doing? Good, thank you for calling and your question. Yes, on Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10, what does the thorn in the flesh mean? Well, uh, you know, if you've ever had a splinter or a thorn, you know that it can be very uncomfortable. Paul is referring to he had a thorn in the flesh that he was being afflicted with a physical, the flesh is your body. Paul had a physical illness, a handicap, that was causing him a lot of problems. Most Bible scholars believe that it was his eyesight. And the reason for that, there's several reasons. Uh, you'll notice as you read the letters of Paul, even though Paul was greatly educated, he has other people write his letters for him. Paul never travels alone because he had trouble seeing. When Paul was in court in, um, I think it's in Acts, he's before the high priest and he says something to the high priest. He's right there standing in front of him. And someone said, how dare you revile the high priest? And Paul squints and goes, oh, I didn't know it was the high priest. <laughs> so you, you see, and then one, when he writes in Galatians, he does say, look at what large characters I'm writing to you with. When Paul did write, he had to write really big letters because his eyesight was so poor. You remember when he first saw Jesus in Acts chapter 9, he was struck completely blind. When Ananias prayed for him, something like scales fell from his eyes and he was able to see, but probably never see perfectly again. It's just like when Jacob wrestled with the angel, uh, God heard his prayer, but Jacob limped the rest of his life. And Paul, after his encounter with Jesus, uh, I don't think his sight was ever quite the same. So it's, it's just like having a, a disability or a sickness? It's, yeah, it's just a, th a thorn in the flesh is some things. typically some handicap. It could be you have arthritis. It could be vision problems, as, you know one of a hundred different things a person might struggle with. And you could pray, Lord, heal me, and he might heal you, and he might say what he said to Paul, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So he used it for the good or the good. Yeah, he can sometimes keep us humble by allowing us to have some physical handicaps. Okay. Hey, thank you. We're going to try and take one more call, Becky. Appreciate your question. We have Carlos listening from California. Carlos, welcome to the program. Carlos, are you on Ridley, California? You may have your uh, mute on. You, are, you, are you there? Carlos? Um, yes. Oh, yes. yeah, your question. your question. We just got two minutes. Yes. Your question. Oh. Uh, you got a question? Yes. Okay. This, uh, um, Revelation and Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. Uh-huh. 
And you want to know what that means? Are you, you know, Carlos, you may have your radio on in the background. It's confusing you with the delay. Revelation chapter 1. You say chapter 1, verse 16? All right, did we lose him again? Nope. Well, let's read this for you. Carlos, if you're listening, we'll... Uh he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And Carlos might be wondering um, yeah. about the two-edged sword. Is that your question? Yes. The two-edged sword is de described for us in Scripture as the Word of God, the uh, sharp two-edged sword. Uh, so when it's talking about Jesus, remember this is a symbolic picture of Jesus, and His Word is powerful, like a sharp two-edged sword, and that's really what's being ref referenced here in this symbolic picture. Yeah, there's a lot of symbolism you find in um, in Revelation. Of course, in Hebrews 4, the Word of God is called a two-edged sword. In Ephesians 6, the Word of God is called a two-edged sword. And uh, it, when it, the very fact it's coming out of Jesus' mouth, I think everyone knows when Christ comes, he's not going to have a literal sword coming out of his mouth. This is a symbol. You would enjoy, Carlos, our study series on Revelation. You can get the Amazing Facts Advanced Study Series by just going to amazingfacts.org. Anybody out there, uh, we have just so many materials online. Uh, you type in Amazing Facts, you're going to find Hundreds, literally hundreds of videos. You're going to find hundreds of Bible studies and uh, study resources. And all you have to do is type in amazingfacts.org. But if you even Google or Yahoo or use one of those search engines, Amazing Facts, it'll take you to our website. You'll also notice there's a little button there. We hope you notice. It says donate because this program is only on the air because of people like you who listen and keep us, keep us going. Thank you so much for being part of tonight's program. We'd love to hear from you again. Write and let us know if it's been a blessing. God willing, we'll study together next week. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your